Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Kirkland Seventh-day Adventist Church live stream. I don't have much for you in the way of announcements this morning. Just the continued announcement to remember your online giving for our church. Just go to ksda.org and then at the top right there is a button for online giving. And if you're wanting to be in the loop for things that are happening with our church and other announcements along the way, make sure you sign up for the e-news, which runs out every Thursday. The way to do that, if you haven't signed up, is to go to the homepage of ksda.org, scroll all the way to the bottom, and there's a bar in there that allows you to enter your email address so that you can be signed up for that. This morning, we are going to continue the series of sermons that we've been working through, but I want to start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that it is Sabbath, that there is this opportunity because of technology for us to still be gathered together in some way. And I thank you for your spirit that unifies us even though we are apart. Pray as we dive into the Bible today that you would give us wisdom and clarity to understand the words that we are reading and the initiative to be able to put into practice anything that we can. Thank you for your love. Uh, thank you for the ways that we see your hand uh, in our day-to-day -day life. Help us to be more aware of your presence every day. We love you very much. Be with us right now in a special way. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are working right now through a series that is looking at the opening verses of the Gospel according to John. The first week was an intro about how John wrote this account for three specific reasons that he specifies at the end of his book. Reason number one, to get you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Two, to get you to believe that he is the Son of God. And three, that by believing in those first two things, you would find life in his name. Last week, we actually dove into the prologue, the first three verses, and just as a recap for you, here are three things that John was trying to communicate through those first three verses. One, that Jesus is ultimate reality. So if you remember the discussion that we had about the word, the logos, Greek philosophers were looking for the logos in the universe, the ultimate reality. And John shows up and says, well, it's not an abstract principle, it's a person. Two, Jesus' story is a creation story. So when John begins this book with, in the beginning, that's communicating to his Jewish readers the kind of story that he's planning to tell. We're going to talk about that more later today. And finally, most significantly, number three, Jesus has not just been with the Creator God eternally, he is the Creator God. Wow. And this introduces us to the mind-bending concept of the Trinity, right? How God is infinitely eternal, but that he is also relational to the core. Today, we're going to keep working through the prologue, and we're going to talk about one of John's absolute favorite things to write about. If you read through his gospel, or even his letters that he writes later in the New Testament— he has two things that he loves to talk about, light and love. So love is the obvious one, right? He will highlight a lot of sayings of Jesus that talk about love, and his own writing is just drenched in the theme of love. But the second thing that he loves to write about is the metaphor of light. Light. So let's read from the prologue and see what he's saying. In the beginning was the Word, we read this last week, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, we're going to read more, but let's stop there for a moment and make sure that we're on the same page. First of all, do you continue to see connections between this story and the creation story? In Genesis, in the beginning, God creates what first? Light. 
And now John is going to talk about light for a little while. Jesus' story is a creation story. But John isn't talking about physical, visible light. What is the light, according to John? You see it there? He tells us point blank in verse 4. Life. Jesus has life, and that life is the light. The light of who? Is it the light of all Jews? Of all the upper class people? No, all mankind. So you'll see throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus will share his light with surprising people. He doesn't just hang out in the synagogue and rub shoulders with the religious elite. No, his light is moving towards tax collectors and outcasts and sinners. In fact, Jesus only once point blank tells someone that he is the Messiah. Do you remember who it is? It's the Samaritan woman in chapter 4 of this gospel. So anyways, Jesus is the light, and his light shines for all mankind, Pharisees and Samaritan women alike. Verse 5, this light shines in the darkness. Okay, so let's just make a quick little chart here to help. Light corresponds to what? Life. Now, if light equals life, then what might darkness relate to? Death. This is going to pop out throughout the gospel as well. Jesus will talk about people who walk in the light versus people who sit in darkness. There's a way of life and flourishing, and there's a way of death. Now, don't go exchanging these words in and out for each other throughout the gospel. That's not the point. This is just to help you see what John is getting at thematically. Jesus came into the world, but the world is full of darkness. This is the last part of the verse here. Jesus' light shines, but the darkness has not overcome it. We're going to talk about this line a little bit more later. Tuck that away. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This isn't the John writing the book. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might what? Believe. So, So remember the purpose of this book from the end of chapter 20 is that you would believe in Jesus and that by believing in his name you would have what? You would have life. So you see this all tied together here. John the Baptist comes to witness about the light so that all would believe. And when you believe, you will find life. Light and life, they're connected. Anyways, he himself, John, was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone, it doesn't play favorites, it shines on everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. This is the tragedy of the story of Jesus, that he is the creator God incarnate, but that his own people largely don't receive him. So, we just read a lot of verses. We could follow a lot of different threads right here. But to make things a little bit more organized, I want to divide up our time into four blocks. I want to talk with you about light, darkness, Jesus, and us. Light, darkness, Jesus, and us. By the end, I think we will have a reasonably full picture of what John is trying to get at with this theme. So firstly, light. Jesus himself says a couple different times in this gospel, I am the light of the world. And remember what John correlates this to, right? He says, in Jesus was life, and this life was the light of all mankind. Light and life, they go together. Now, this is 
something that's very Christian. I'm sure that you have heard this dozens, if not hundreds of times in your life. Jesus is the source of all life and truth. Come to him if you want to have eternal life. The most famous verse in all of scripture is John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that what? So that we might have eternal life. I just have a quick point to make right here. When we talk about eternal life, what we often think of is life forever in heaven with God. Or more correctly, life in the new earth forever with God. But the Bible presents eternal life as something more than just a future condition where we never die. Eternal life is only once clearly defined in the entire Bible, and it's the words of Jesus himself. This is John chapter 17. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Huh. What is eternal life? It's knowing God. Okay, so this was a total paradigm shift for me. Uh, Here's a picture to help illustrate. Many Christians think of eternal life as something that begins after the grave, something that, that starts after the return of Jesus. But Jesus introduces a reality where eternal life can begin here and now and carry into the eternal reign and rule of Jesus at his return. How? Because eternal life is primarily qualitative, not quantitative. Eternal life is knowing God living in and with his presence. And because of Jesus, we can each begin to experience some of that right here and now. Wow, boy, we could do a whole Bible study on this, but here's all that I want you to catch for what we're talking about today. The light of Jesus is not just some intellectual truth to grasp. It is a new reality that you're invited to live in and experience. Because of Jesus, we each can begin to experience some of eternal life, knowledge of and relationship with God, even right now. It's some of tomorrow, today, as I like to say. Now, we could camp out here for a long time. All that to say, when Jesus shows up and announces that he is the light of the world, it means much more than just I am the well of intellectual and theological truth. Jesus is introducing a new way of living. All right, next one, darkness. John says that this light shines in the darkness. I was reading something about Shackleton's Antarctic expedition back during the early 1900s. You remember this, right? So there was the captain named Shackleton who took a crew of men, and their goal was that they were going to walk across Antarctica. Well, the problem was their ship got stuck in the ice, and it eventually got crushed by the ice. So what started as an exploration trip turned into a survival mission, and it lasted months and months. It's really incredible. Anyways, the thing that I was reading was saying that of all of the challenges and difficulties that they faced, freezing temperatures, starvation, the worst of all of them was the darkness. You see, in the South Pole, the sun will go down sometime around mid-May, and it won't come back up until late July. So there's no daylight, no sunlight for over two months. And the effect on this crew of men was maddening and disorienting. You can't see what's in front of you, who's around you. You have no sense of direction. Well, you know, it's not just physical darkness that is disorienting, spiritual darkness is the same. Spiritual darkness is when we disorient our hearts from God as our true center. The contrast that John is trying to draw here 
is that God is the source of all life and truth. He is light. And if you orbit yourself around him, then your life will have true meaning and purpose. But if you orient yourself around anything else, no matter how fulfilling that thing might seem, that is to live in disorientation, to live in darkness. And Jesus comes to rescue us from this. Listen to his own words in chapter 12. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Now this sounds nice, But how does Jesus do it? How can Jesus free people from darkness so that they can live in the light? Well, this is the beautiful reversal of the cross. Jesus, who is by nature light and life, absorbs all of our darkness and death on the cross. His sacrifice paves the way so that we can experience light and life in the presence of God. This brings us back to a phrase that I said that we were going to look at later. This is John 1 verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now that's the NIV, but you might have a Bible that says the darkness did not comprehend it. So the word John picks here is ambiguous. It can mean to overcome or overpower, but it can also mean to understand or comprehend. So a helpful English equivalent might be the word master. So if you master something, that can mean that you overpowered it, or it can mean that you figured it out and you now understand it. Same idea. The the darkness did not master it. So which meaning is it? I think it could be both. And that's kind of the point. Jesus enters a world of darkness and disorientation. And when he shows up and reveals the light, the world doesn't really understand. Jesus' ethical system and his way of coming to reign as a suffering servant, it all feels so upside down that people don't really get it. But do you remember this chart? If light corresponds to life, then darkness corresponds to death. Not only could this disoriented world of darkness not understand Jesus and his mission, but death also couldn't overpower him. Jesus comes bringing a new reign and rule of life, and the former rule of death cannot overcome this. Isn't that good news? So we've talked about light, we've talked about darkness, now let's talk about Jesus. I just want to say a quick word here about how Jesus brings this light into the world. So let's talk about light bulbs. (laughs) There are two basic kinds of light bulbs, fluorescent and incandescent light bulbs. I did some reading on Wikipedia, the best place to go for scientific answers, just to make sure that I had all of this right. So these two kinds of bulbs, they produce light in very different ways. I brought props with me. (laughs) So this is an incandescent light bulb. Incandescent bulbs work when electricity heats up a filament inside of the light bulb, and when that filament gets hot enough, it begins to emit light. Simple enough, right? Fluorescent light bulbs are much more complicated. (laughs) So you notice that they are always in tubes of some sort. So whether they are long and straight, or if they go in a lamp like this one, it's a tube that kind of spirals around. And that's because there needs to be two ends in a fluorescent bulb. Fluorescent light bulbs are full of gas. And when the electricity turns on, all of the electrons inside of the light bulb begin running around and colliding with new gases that are being released. And this causes the electrons inside the bulb to get so energized that they begin to emit light. Now, in fact, it's not actually a light that's visible to the human eye. This is why fluorescent light bulbs always have this white coating on the inside of them. This is a special chemical coating that causes the invisible light 
to become visible. Super strange and nerdy, and it kind of blew my mind just reading about this. <laughs> Here's the point that I want you to catch. There's a significant difference between a fluorescent light bulb and an incandescent light bulb. Incandescent light bulbs emit both light and heat. Th that's how it works, right? It heats up the filament. So you don't want to touch an incandescent bulb after it's been on for even just a little while. Very hot. Fluorescent light bulbs emit only light and a little bit of heat, but mostly just light that makes them much more energy efficient. So fluorescent light bulbs give off light. Incandescent light bulbs give off light and warmth. Why are we talking about light bulbs? Jesus comes into a world of darkness as an incandescent light. He comes with light and warmth. Or to use the language of John later in this prologue, he comes with grace and truth. He comes to present the will of the Father, but also the love of the Father. This is how Jesus changed the course of history. Not by just showing up and telling everyone everything that was true and right and then flying off to heaven. He did it by getting his hands dirty so that we could see and experience the height and depth and breadth of God's love by washing feet and standing up for the vulnerable and eventually dying as an innocent man, Jesus comes as the light to warm our cold, darkened, disoriented hearts to the love of the Father. Which finally brings us to us. We talked about last week how the mission of Jesus extends to us. Just as Jesus made the Father three-dimensional, so we are to make Jesus three-dimensional. Well, the same applies to this theme of light. Jesus doesn't just give off warmth and light so that Christians today can read about it and experience it for ourselves. No, we are to become beacons of this very same light to our world today. You know Jesus' famous, I am the light of the world statement? Do you know what comes right after that? Let's read it. This is John chapter 8. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, when we follow Jesus, we aren't just hanging out in the light. The light of Jesus fills us from the inside out, and we begin to reflect it to others. Jesus makes this even more clear later. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may what? Become children of light. What's Jesus saying here? What does it mean to become children of light? It's that the grace and truth that we see in Jesus is something that should grow and flourish in our own lives. John is talking in dense metaphors here, but what he's talking about is incredibly practical. You've seen this vertical horizontal thing before, right? Where the vertical axis is about your relationship with God and the horizontal axis is about your relationship with God with others. And it makes a cross, right? The Christian call is to show love towards both. But let me up the ante for you. This is where the challenge comes, isn't it? A disciple of Jesus is called to take whatever relational love and life that we receive from our walk with God vertical, and extend that to both our allies and our enemies. That's what Jesus did. That's what we are to do. John writes this later in his letter to the church. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. 
Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. So do you see how this is all becoming connected? Jesus' light is the knowledge and experience of God's love. And he has called us to share this same light, this same love, with everyone around us. I know that this sermon has been a little unwieldy. (laughs) It's hard to wrap your arms around a theme that John unpacks in so many different ways. But my hope here is that I have opened a few doors, just enough, to help you in your own study of the Gospel of John. So, now for a few questions. Again, if you haven't been watching this series, I'm ending these sermons with a few questions that you can talk through with those that you are watching with, or if you're watching on your own, you are welcome to just think through them or maybe write out some thoughts. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually been doing this, taking the time to work through the questions, but even if you don't do it right after this live stream ends, I would still encourage you to come back and work through these questions at some point. There's lots of studies done about the minimal amount that we retain just from hearing something. So if you're able to take some time to look into these questions on your own, it's gonna help this stick better. Okay, so the first thing on my list is for those of you who really love to connect to God through music, this is just for you. I have a little project. Listen to or look up the lyrics to Here I am to worship, very common song. While I was working on this sermon, this particular song came to mind, and I was surprised at how much of the lyrics are drenched in this idea of light and life. Just look it up, listen to the first couple minutes. In the song, this theme that you see in the verses leads to worship. That's what the title of the song is, right? My question is why? Why is worship the response to Jesus being the light? The lyrics of this song paint a really beautiful picture that I think is true to the gospel. So just think about it. Second, read Psalm 36, verses 5 to 9. Notice in there the connection between light and life. The last line in the psalm reads, In your light we see light. How does God's light enable us to see light? What exactly are we looking for? Hint, verses 5 through 8 of that psalm give you some clues. These are beautiful words. Take a moment to reflect on them. Okay, third, read John 17, verse 3 again. So we talked about this verse earlier. This was the one about what eternal life is. What do you think about how Jesus defines eternal life there? How does this affect your understanding of John 3.16 and the whole gospel? Like I said, this verse was paradigm shifting for me, and it really has helped the gospel come to life. Finally, a personal application question for you to think about. How can you be an incandescent light for God? So remember, incandescent lights provide light and warmth. What does it look like for you to give off both in your life? Those are my questions for you. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and then the questions will go back up if you want to take a picture of them or pause on the screen so that you can work through them. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your light into the world. Thank you that you are a God who isn't only concerned with us understanding about you, but that you're primarily concerned with us getting to know you relationally, becoming invested in a walk with you. This is something that we see in the mission of Jesus, and I pray that it's something that can be seen in the lives of every member of our church here that we are just passionate about following you and getting to know you more and more every day. I pray that you be with our community, that you restore health and peace 
to a world that seems to be going a little crazy. I pray that we as the church can be beacons of light. That we don't just share hope and talk about it, but that we display it through the warmth of our actions. I pray that you send the Holy Spirit into the homes of everyone watching here today. May you fill them with light so that they can be beacons of that light to those that they come in contact with. Thank you for our Sabbath rest, this time to just pause, catch our breath, and reorient towards you. We love you very much, and we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for watching our live stream. I say it every week, but I'm going to say it again. Subscribe to our channel. Make sure that you have that so that every day any new content can come into your feed. All right, we will see you for Better News Daily throughout this week, or we will see you next week for our live stream once again. Here are the study questions for you to look into if you missed them the first time around. Have a wonderful Sabbath day.